She was looking at him wistfully, half leaning against a wall, her hands on her hips. Then suddenly he knew how to draw her out, to drive her from her mind all the thought of teasing him. He reached into his pocket and drew forth the roll of bills. Smiling, he held it in his palm and spoke as though to himself. Well, I reckon somebody else might like this if you don't. She came a step forward. Bigger G, where you get all that money from? What you like to know? How much is it? What you care? She came to a side. How much is it, really? What do you want to know for? Let me see it. I'll give it back to you. I'll let you see it, but you have to stay in my hand. See? He watched the expression of coyness on her face change to one of amusement as she counted the bills. Lord Bigger, where you get this money from? Wouldn't you like to know, he said, slipping his arm about her waist. Is it yours? What in the hell you reckon I'm doing with it? Tell me where you got it from, honey. You going to be sweet to me? He felt her body growing gradually less stiff, but her eyes were searching his face. Ain't you got into nothing, is you? You going to be sweet to me? Oh, Bigger, kiss me, honey. He felt her relax completely. He kissed her and she drew him to the bed. They sat down. Gently, she took the money from his hand. How much is it, he asked. Don't you know? Nah. Didn't you count it? Nah. Bigger, where you get this money from? Maybe I'll tell you someday, he said, leaning back and, test and resting his head on the pillow. You into something? How much is there? $125. You going to be sweet to me? But Bigger, where did you get this money from? What do you, what do that matter? You going to buy me something? Sure. What, anything you want? They were silent for a moment. Finally, his arm was about her waist. He felt her body relax into a softness he knew and wanted. She rested her head on the pillow. He put the money in his pocket and leaned over. Gee, honey, I've been wanting you bad. For real. Honest to God. He placed his hands on her breast just as he had placed them on Mary's last night, and he was thinking of that while he kissed her. He took his lips away for breath and heard Bessie say, Don't stay away so long from me. Here, honey, I won't. You love me? Sure. He kissed her again, and he felt her arm lifting above his head, and he heard the click as the light went out. He kissed her again, hard. Bessie, huh? Come on, honey. They were still a moment longer. Then she rose. He waited. He heard her clothes rustling in the darkness. She was undressing. He got up and began to undress. Gradually, he began to see in the darkness. She was on the other side of the bed, her dark body like a shadow in the denser darkness surrounding her. He heard the bed creak as she lay down. He went to her, folding her into his arms, mumbling, Gee, kid. He felt two soft palms holding his face tenderly, and the thought and image of the whole blind world, which had made him ashamed and afraid, fell away as he felt her as fallow field beneath him, stretching out under a cloudy sky waiting for rain. And he slept in her body, rising and sinking with the ebb and flow of her blood, being willingly dragged into a warm night sea to rise renewed to a surface, to face a world he hated and wanted to blot out of existence, clinging close to a fountain whose warm waters washed and cleaned his senses, cooled them, made them strong and keen again, to see and smell and touch and taste and hear. Cleared them to end the tiredness and reforge in him a new sense of time and space. After he had been tossed to dry upon a warm sunlit rock under a white sky, he lifted his hands slowly and heavily and touched Bessie's lips with his fingers and mumbled, gee kid, bigger. He took his hand away and relaxed. He did not feel that he wanted to step forth and resume where he had left off living, not just yet. He was lying on the bottom of a dark pit upon a pallet of warm wet straw, and at the top of the pit he could see the cold blue of the distant sky. Some hand had reached inside of him and had laid a quiet finger of peace upon the restless tossing of his spirit and had made him feel that he did not need to long for a home now. Then, like the long withdrawing sound of a receding wave, the sense of night and sea and warmth went from him, and he lay looking in the darkness at the shadowy outline of Bessie's body, hearing his and her breathing. Bigger? Huh. You like your job? Yeah, why? I just asked. You swell? You mean that? Sure. Where are you working? Over on Drexel. Where? In the 4600 block. Oh, what? Nothing. But what? Oh, I just happened to think of something. Tell me, what is it? It ain't nothing bigger, honey. What did she mean by asking all these questions? He wondered if she had detected anything in him. Then he wondered if he were not letting fear get the better of him by thinking always in terms of Mary and of her having been smothered and burnt. But he wanted to know why she had asked where he worked. Come on, honey, tell me what you're thinking. It ain't nothing much bigger. I used to work over in that section, not far from where Loeb li folks lived. Loeb? Yeah. One of the families of them boys that killed the Frank boys, remember? Now what you mean. You remember hearing people talking about Leob and Lope, Leopold? Oh, the ones who killed the boy and then tried to get money from the boy's family? By sending them notes, by sending notes to them, Bigger was not listening. 
The world of sound fell abruptly away from him and a vast picture appeared before his eyes, a picture teeming with so much meaning that he could not re react to it all at once. He lay, his eyes unblinking, his heart pounding, his lips slightly open, his breath coming and going so softly that it seemed he was not breathing at all. You remember them all and you ain't even listening. He said nothing. How come you won't listen when I talk to you? Why could he? Why could he not not send a letter to the Daltons asking for money? Bigger. He sat up in bed, staring into the darkness. What's the matter, honey? He could ask for $10,000 or maybe twenty. Bigger, what's the matter? I'm talking to you. He did not answer. His nerves were taut with a hard effort to remember something. Now, yes, Leob and Leopold had planned to have the father of the murdered boy get on a train and throw the money out of the window while passing some spot. He leapt from bed and stood in the middle of the floor. Bigger, he could, yes, he could have them pack the money in a shoebox and have them throw it out a car window somewhere on the south side. He looked round in the darkness, feeling Bessie's fingers on his arms. He came to himself and sighed. What's the matter, honey, he asked. Huh? What's on your mind? Nothing. Come on and tell me. You're worried. Nah, nah. Now, I told you what was on my mind, but you won't tell me what's on yours. That ain't fair. I just forgot something, that's all. That ain't what you was thinking about, she said. He sat back on the bed, feeling his scalp tingle with excitement. Could he do it? This was what had been missing, with, and this was what could make the thing complete. But this thing was so big, he would have to take time and think it carefully. Honey, tell me where you got the money. What money, he asked in a tone of feigned surprise. Ah, bigger, I know something's wrong. You worried. You got something on your mind. I can tell it. You want me to make something up to tell you? All right, if that's the way you feel about it. Ah, Bessie, you didn't have to come here tonight. Maybe I shouldn't have come. You don't have to come no more. Don't you love me? About as much as you love me. How much is that? You ought to know. Ah, let's stop fussing, he said. He felt the bag sag gently and heard the bed covers rustling as she pulled them over her. He turned his head and stared at the dim whites of her eyes in the darkness. Maybe, yes, maybe he could, maybe he could use her. He leaned and stretched himself on the bed beside her. She did not move. He put his hand upon her shoulder, pressing it just softly enough to let her know that he was thinking about her. His mind tried to grasp and encompass as much of her life as he could, tried to understand and weigh it in relation to his own, as his hand rested on her shoulder. Could he trust her? How much could he tell her? Would she act with him, blindly, believing his word? Come on, let's get dressed and go out and get something to drink, she said. Okay. You ain't acting like you always act tonight. I got something on my mind. Can't you tell me? I don't know. Don't you trust me? Sure. Then why don't you tell me? He did not answer. Her voice had come in a whisper, a whisper he had heard many times before when she wanted something badly. It brought to him a full sense of her life, what he had been thinking and feeling when he placed his hand upon her shoulder. The same deep realization he had that morning at home at the breakfast table while watching Vera and Buddy and his mother came back to him. Only it was Bessie he was looking at now and seeing how blind she was. He felt the narrow orbit of her life. From her room to the kitchen of the white folks was the furthest she ever moved. She worked long hours, hard and hot hours, seven days a week with only Sunday afternoons off. And when she did get off, she wanted fun, hard and fast fun, something to make her feel that she was making up for the starved life she led. It was her hankering for a sensation that he liked about her. Most nights she was too tired to go out. She only wanted to get drunk. She wanted liquor and he wanted her. So he would give her lick the liquor and she would give him herself. He had heard her complain about how hard the white folks worked her. She had told him over and over again that, the live, that she lived their lives when she was working in their homes, not her own. That's why when she told him, she drank. She knew why she liked him. He gave her money for drinks. He knew that if he did not do it, give it to her, someone else would. She would see to that. Bessie, too, was very blind. What ought he tell her? She might come in just handy. Then he realized that whatever he chose to tell her ought not to be anything that would make her feel in any way out of it. She ought to be made to feel that she knew it all. Goddamn, he just simply could not get used to acting like he ought. He should not have made her think that something was happening that he did not want her to know. Give me time, honey, and I'll tell you, he said, trying to straighten things out. You don't have to unless you want to. Don't be that way. You can't treat me any old way, bigger. I ain't trying to, honey. You can't play me cheap. Take it easy. I know what I'm doing. I hope you do. For Christ's sake. Ah, oh, come on. I want a drink. Now listen. Keep your business. You don't have to tell me. But don't come run to me when you need a friend, see? When we get a couple of drinks, I'll tell you about it. Suit yourself. He saw her waiting at the door for him. He put on his coat and cap, and they walked slowly down the stairs, saying nothing. It seemed warmer outside, as though it were going to snow again. The sky was low and dark. The wind blew. 
As he walked beside Bessie, his feet sank into the soft snow. The streets were empty and silent, stretching before him white and clean under the vanishing glow of a long string of street lamps. As he walked, he saw out of the corner of his eyes Bessie striding beside him, and it seemed that his mind could feel the soft swing of her body as it went forward. He yearned suddenly to be back in bed with her, feeling her body warm and pliant to his. But the look on her face was a hard and distant one. It separated him from her body by a great suggestion of space. He not really wanted to go out with her tonight, but her questions and suspicions had made him say yes when she wanted to go for a drink. As he walked beside her, he felt that there were two Bessies, one a body that he had just had and wanted badly again. The other was in Bessie's face. It asked questions. It bargained and sold the other Bessie to advantage. He wished he could clench his fist and swing his arm and blot out, kill, sweep away the Bessie on Bessie's face and leave the other helpless and yielding before him. He could then gather her up and put her on his chest, his stomach, someplace deep inside him, always keeping her there even when he slept, ate, talked, keeping her there just to feel and know that she was going to have, was his to have and hold whenever he wanted to. Where are you going? Wherever you want to. Let's go to the Paris Grill. Okay. They turned a corner and walked to the middle of the block to the grill and went in. An automatic phonograph was playing. They went to a rear table. Bigger ordered two slow gin fizzes. They sat in silent, looking at each other, waiting. He saw Bessie's shoulders jerking in rhythm to the music. Would she help him? Well, he would ask her. He would frame the story so that she would not have to know everything. He knew that she should have asked her to dance, but the excitement that had hold of him would not let him. He was feeling different tonight from every other night. He did not need to dance and sing and clown over the floor in order to blot out a day and night of doing nothing. He was full of excitement. The waitress brought the drinks and Bestie lifted hers. Here's to you, even if you don't want to talk, and even if you is acting queer. Bessie, I'm worried. Well, I'll come on and drink, she said. Okay. They sipped. Bigger, huh? Can I help you in what you're doing? Maybe. I want to. You trust me? I have so far. I mean now. Yes, if you can tell me what to trust you for. Maybe I can't do that. Then you don't trust me. It's got to be that way, Bessie. If I trusted you, would you tell me? Maybe. Don't say maybe, Bigger. Listen, honey, he said not liking the way he was talking to her, but afraid of telling her outright. The, we the reason I'm acting this way is I got something big on. What? It'll mean a lot of money. I wish you'd either tell me or quit talking about it. They were silent. He saw Bessie drain her glass. I'm ready to go, she said. Uh, I just want to get some sleep. You mad? Maybe. He did not want her to be that way. How could he make her stay? How much could he tell her? He could make her trust him without telling everything. He suddenly felt she would come closer to him if he made her feel that he was in danger. That's it. Make her feel concerned about him. Maybe I'll have to get out of town soon, he said. The police? Maybe. What you doing? I'm planning to do it now. But where you get that money? Look, Bessie, if I have to leave town and want a dough, would you help me if I split with you? If you took me with you, you wouldn't have to split. He was silent. He had not thought of Bessie being with him. A woman was a dangerous burden when a man was running away. He had read of how men had been caught because of women, and he did not want that to happen to him. But if, yes, but if he told her, yes, just enough to get her to work with him? Okay, he said, I'll say this much. I'll take you if you help me. You really mean that? Sure. Then you going to tell me? Yes, he could dress the story up. Why even mention Jan? Why not tell it so that if she were ever questioned, she would say the things that he wanted her to say, things that would help him? He lifted the glass and drained the liquor and set it down and leaned forward and toyed with the cigarettes in his finger. He spoke with bated breath. Listen, here's the dope, see? The gale where I'm working, the daughter of the old man who's a rich millionaire, has run off with a red, see? Eloped? Huh? Er, yeah, eloped. With a red? Yeah, one of them communists. Oh, what's wrong with her? Ah, oh, she's crazy. Nobody don't know she's gone, so last night I took the money from her room, see? Oh, they don't know where she is? But what are you going to do? They don't know where she is, he said again. What you mean? He sucked his cigarette. He saw her looking at him, her black eyes wide with eager interest. He liked that look. In one way, he hated to tell her because he wanted to keep her guessing. He wanted to take as long as possible in order to see the look of complete absorption on her face. It made him feel alive and gave him a heightened sense of the value of himself. I got an idea, he said. Oh, bigger, tell me. Don't talk so loud. Well, tell me. They don't know where this girl is. They might think she's kidnapped, see? His whole body was tense as he spoke, his lips trembled. Oh, that was what you were so excited about when I told you about Leah and Leopold? Well, what you think? Would they really think she's kidnapped? We can make them think it. She looked into her empty glass. Bigger beckoned the waitress and ordered two more drinks. 
He took a deep swallow and said, The gal's gone, see? They don't know where she is. Don't nobody know, but they think she might think, but they might think somebody did it if they told was, see? You mean, you mean we could say we did it? You mean write to them and ask for money? Sure, he said, and get it too. You see, we cash in because nobody else is trying to. But suppose she shows up. She won't. How you know? I just know she won't. Bigger, you know something about that girl. You know where she is. That's all right about where she is. I know we won't have to worry about her showing up, see? Oh, Bigger, this is crazy. Then hell, we won't talk about it no more. Oh, I don't mean that. Then what do you mean? I mean, we gotta be careful. We can get $10,000. How? We can have them leave the money somewhere. They'll think they can get the girl back. Bigger, you know where that girl is? She said, giving her voice a tone of half question and half statement. Nah, then we'll be in the papers. She'll show up. She won't. How you know? She just won't. He saw her lips moving, then heard her speak softly, leaning toward him. Bigger, you ain't done nothing to that girl, is you? He stiffened with fear. He suddenly felt that he wanted something in his hand, something solid and heavy, his gun, a knife, a brick. If you say that again, I'll slap you back from this table. Oh, come on now, don't be a fool. Bigger, you oughtn't have done it. You want to help me? Say yes or no. Gee, Bigger, you scared? You scared after letting me take that silver from Miss Hurd's home? After letting me get Miss Macy's radio? You scared now? I don't know. You wanted me to tell you. Well, I told you. That's a woman always. You want to know something, then you run like a rabbit. But we'll get caught. Not if we do it right. But how can we do it, Bigger? I'll figure it out. But I want to know. It'll be easy. But how? I can fix it so you can pick up the money and nobody will bother you. They'll catch the people who do things like that. If you're scared, they will catch you. How could I pick up the money? We'll tell them, to leave. We'll tell them where to leave it. But they'll have police watching. Not if they want the gal back. We got a club over them, see? And I'll be watching too. I work in the house where they live. If they try to double cross us, I'll let you know. You reckon we could do it? We could have them throw the money out of a car. You could be in some spot to see if they send anybody to watch. If you see anybody around, then you don't touch the money, see? But they want the gal. They won't watch. There was a long silence. Bigger, I don't know, she said. We could go to New York, to Harlem if we had money. New York's a real town. We could lay low for a while. But suppose they mark the money. They won't. And if they do, I'll tell you. You see, I'm right there in the house. But if we run off, they'll think we did it. They'll be looking for us for years, Bigger. We won't run away. We'll lay low for a while. I don't know, Bigger. He felt satisfied. He could tell by the way she looked at him that if he pushed her hard enough, she would come in with him. She was afraid and he could get her and he could handle her through the fear. He looked at his watch. It was getting late. He ought to go back and have a look at the furnace. Listen, I gotta go. He paid the waitress and they went out. There was another way to bind him to her. He drew forth a roll of bills, peeled off one for himself, and held out the rest of the money toward her. Here, he said, you get, go get something and save the rest for me. Oh, she looked at the money and hesitated. Don't you want it? Yeah, she said, taking the roll. If you string along with me, you'll get plenty more. They stopped in front of her door. He stood looking at her. Well, he said, what do you think? Bigger, honey, I, I don't know, she said plaintively. He wanted me to tell you. I'm scared. Don't you trust me? But we ain't never done something like this before. They'll look everywhere for us for something like this. It ain't like coming to where I work at night when the white folks has gone out of town and stealing something. It ain't. It's up to you. I'm scared, Bigger. Who on earth will think we did it? I don't know. You really think they don't know where the girl is? I know they don't. You know? Nah. She'll turn up. She won't, and anyhow, she's a crazy girl. They might even think she's in it herself just to get the money from her family. They might think the Red is doing it. They won't think we did it. They don't think we got enough guts to do it. They think we's too scared. I don't know. Did I ever tell you wrong? Nah, but we ain't never, never done nothing like this before. Well, I ain't wrong now. When do you want to do it? Soon as they begin to worry about the girl. You reckon we could? I told you what I think. Nah, Bigger, I ain't going to do it. I think you... He turned abruptly and walked away from him. Bigger, she ran over the snow and tugged at his sleeve. He stopped but did not turn around. She caught his coat and pulled him about. Under the yellow sheen of a street lamp, they confronted each other silently. All about them was the white snow in the night. They were cut off from the world and were conscious only of each other. He looked at her without expression, waiting. Her eyes were fastened fearfully and distrustfully upon his face. He held his body in an attitude that suggested that he would delicately balanced upon a hairline, waiting to see if she would push him forward or draw him back. Her lips smiled faintly, and she lifted her hand and touched his face with her fingers. 
He knew that she was fighting out in her feelings the question of just how much he meant to her. She grabbed his hand and squeezed it, telling him in the pressure of her fingers that she wanted him. But bigger, honey, let's don't do that. We're getting along all right like we is now. He drew his hand away. I'm going, he said. When will I see you, honey? I don't know. He started off again, and she overtook him and encircled him with her arms. Bigger, honey, come on, Bessie. What you going to do? She looked at him with round, helpless black eyes. He was still poised, wondering if she would pull toward her or let him fall alone. He was enjoying her agony, seeing and feeling the worth of himself in her bewildered des desperation. Her lips trembled and she began to cry. What are you going to do, he asked. If I do it, it's because you want me to, she sobbed. He put his arm about her shoulders. Come on, Bessie, he said, don't cry. She stopped and dried her eyes. He looked closely at her. She'll do it, he thought. I gotta go, he said. I ain't going in right now. Where are you going? He found that he was afraid of what she did now that she was working with him. His peace of mind depended upon knowing what she did and why. I'm going to get a pint. That was all right. She was feeling as he knew she always felt. Well, I'll see you tomorrow night, huh? Okay, honey, be careful. Look, Bessie, don't you worry none. Just trust me. No matter what happens, they won't catch us, and they won't even know you had anything to do with it. If they start after us, where could we hide bigger? You know he's black. We can't just go anywhere. He looked round the lamp-lit, snow-covered street. There's plenty of places, he said. I know the south side from A to Z. We could even hide in one of those old buildings, see? Like I did last time. Nobody ever looks into them. He pointed across the street to a black, looming, empty apartment building. Well, she said, I'm going, he said. So long, honey. He walked toward the car line. When he looked back, he saw her still standing in the snow. She had not moved. She'll be all right, he thought. She'll go along. Snow was falling again. The streets were long paths leading through a dense jungle, lit here and there with torches held high in the invisible hand. He waited ten minutes for a car and none came. He turned the corner and walked, his head down, his hands dug into his pockets going to Dalton's. He was confident. During the last day and night, few new fears had come, but new feelings had developed to allay those fears. The moment when he had stood above Mary's bed and found that she was dead, the fear of electrocution had entered his flesh and blood. But at home at the breakfast table with his mother and sister and brother, seeing how blind they were, and overhearing Peggy and Mrs. Dalton talking in the kitchen, a new feeling had been born in him, a feeling that all but blotted out the fear of death. As long as he moved carefully and knew that he was about, he could handle things, he thought. As long as he could take his life into his own hands and dispose of it as he pleased, as long as he could decide just when and where he would run to, he need not be afraid. He felt that his destiny was in his grasp. He was more alive than he could ever remember having been. His mind and attention were pointed, focused towards a goal. For the first time in his life, he moved consciously between two sharply defined poles. He was now moving away from the threatening penalty of death, from the death-like times that brought him tightness and hotness in his chest, and he was moving toward the sense of fullness he had so often but inadequately felt in magazines and movies. The shame and fear and hate which Mary and Jan and Mr. Dalton and that huge rich house had made rise so hard and hot in him had now cooled and softened. But he had not done what they thought he could do. His being black and at the bottom of the world was something which he could take with a newborn strength. What his knife and gun had once meant to him, his knowledge of having secretly murdered Mary now meant. No matter how they laughed at him for his being black and clown-like, he could look them in the eye and not feel angry. The feeling of being always enclosed in the stifling embrace of an invisible force had gone from him. As he turned into Drexel Boulevard and headed toward the Daltons, he thought of how restless he had been, how he was consumed always with the body hunger. Well, in a way, he had settled that tonight. As time passed, he would make it more definite. His body felt free and easy now that he had lain with Bessie. That she would do what he wanted was what he had sealed in asking her to work with him in this thing. She would be bound to him by ties deeper than marriage. She would be his. Her fear of capture and death would bind her to him with all the strength of her life, even as what he had done last night had bound him to this new path with all the strength of his own life. He turned off the sidewalk and walked up the Dalton driveway, went in the basement and looked through the bright cracks of the furnace door. He saw a red heap of ceiling coals and heard the upward hum of the draft. He pulled the lever, hearing the rattle of the coal against tin and seeing the quivering embers grow black. He shut off the coal and stooped and opened the bottom drawer of the furnace. Ashes were piling up. He would have to take the shovel and clean them out in the morning and make sure that no unburnt bones were left. He had closed the door and started the rear of the furnace, going to his room when he heard Peggy's voice. Bigger. He stopped, and before answering, he felt a keen sensation of excitement flush all over his skin. She was standing at the head of the stairs and in the door leading to the kitchen. Yes, um. He went to the bottom of the steps and looked upward. Mrs. Dalton wants you to pick up the trunk at the station. The trunk? 
He waited for Peggy to answer his surprise question. Perhaps he should have not asked it in that way. They called up and said that no one claimed it. And Mr. Dalton got a wire from Detroit. Mary never got there. Yes, um. She came all the way down the stairs and looked round the basement as though seeking some missing detail. He stiffened. If she saw something that would make her ask him about Mary, he would take the iron shovel and let her have it straight across the head and then take the car and make a quick getaway. Mr. Dalton's worried, Peggy said. You know, Mary didn't pack the new clothes she bought to take with her on a trip. And poor Mrs. Dalton's been pacing the floor and phoning Mary's friends all day. Don't nobody know where she is, Bigger asked. Nobody. Did Mary tell you to the, take the trunk like it was? Yes, and he said, knowing that this was the first hard hurdle. It was locked and standing in a corner. I took it down and put it right where you saw it this morning. Oh, Peggy, Mrs. Dalton's voice called. Yes, Peggy answered. Bigger looked up and saw Mrs. Dalton at the head of the stairs, standing in white as usual, with her face tilted trustingly upward. Is the boy back yet? He's down here now, Mrs. Dalton. Come in the kitchen a moment, will you, Bigger, she asked. Yes, um. He followed Peggy into the kitchen. Mrs. Dalton had her hands clasped tightly in front of her, and her face was still tilted, higher now, and her white lips were parted. Peggy told you about picking up the trunk? Yes, I'm on my way now. What time did you leave here last night? A little before two, ma'am. And she told you to take the trunk down? Yes, I'm. And she told you not to put the car up? Yes, I'm. And it was just where you left it last night when you came home this morning? Yes, I'm. Mrs. Dalton turned her head as she heard the inner kitchen door open. Mr. Dalton stood in the doorway. Hello, Bigger. Good day, sir. How are things? Fine, sir. The station called about the trunk a little while ago. You'll have to pick it up. Yes, sir, I'm on my way now, sir. Listen, Bigger, what happened last night? Well, nothing, sir. Miss Dalton told me to take the trunk down so I could take it to the station this morning, and I did. Was Jan with you? Yes, sir. All three of us went upstairs when I brought him in the car. We went to the room to get the trunk, then I took it down and put it in the basement. Was Jan drunk? Well, I don't know, sir. There was drinking. And what happened? Nothing, sir. I just took the trunk to the basement and left. Miss Dalton told me to leave the car out. She said Jan would take care of it. What were they talking about? Bigger hung his head. I don't know, sir. He saw Mrs. Dalton lift her right hand, and he knew that she meant for Mr. Dalton to stop questioning him too closely. He felt her shame. That's all right, Bigger, Mrs. Dalton said. She turned to Mr. Dalton. Where do you suppose this Jan would be now? Maybe he's at the labor defender office. Can you get in touch with him? Well, said Mr. Dalton, standing near Bigger and looking hard at the floor, I could, but I'd rather wait. I still think Mary's up to some of her foolish pranks. Bigger, you better get that trunk. Yes, sir. He got the car and drove through the falling snow toward the loop. And answering their questions, he felt that he had succeeded in turning their minds definitely in the direction of Jan. If things went at this pace, he would have to send the ransom note right away. He would see Bessie tomorrow and get things settled. Yes, he would ask for $10,000. He would have Bessie stand in the window of an old building at some well-lighted street corner with a flashlight. In the note, he would tell Mr. Dalton to put the money in a shoebox and drop it in the snow at the curb. He would tell him to keep his car moving and his lights blinking and not to drop the money until he saw the flashlight blink three times in the window. Yes, that's how it would be. Bessie would see the lights in Mr. Carton's Dal Mr. Dalton's car blinking, and after the car was gone, she would pick up the box of money. It would be easy. He pulled the car into the station, presented the ticket, got the trunk, hoisted it to the running board, and headed again for the Dalton home. When he reached the driveway, snow was falling so thickly that he could not see ten feet in front of him. He put the car in the garage, set the trunk in the snow, locked the garage door, lifted the trunk to his back, and carried it to the entrance of the basement. Yes, the trunk was light. It was half empty. No doubt they would question him about that. Next time, he would have to go into detail, and he would have to try to fasten hard in his mind the words he spoke so that he could repeat them a thousand times if necessary. He could, of course, set the trunk in the snow right now and take a streetcar and get the money from Bessie and leave town. But why do that? He could handle this thing. It was going his way. They were not suspecting him, and he would be able to tell the moment their minds turned in his direction. And two, he was glad he had left Bessie that money. Suppose he were searched here on the job. For them to find money on him was alone enough to fasten suspicion upon him definitely. He unlocked the door and took the trunk inside. His back went was bent beneath its weight, and he walked slowly with his eyes on the wavering red shadows on the floor. He heard the fire singing in the furnace. He took the trunk to the corner in which he had placed it the night before. He put it down and looked inside it. He had an impulse to open it and look inside. He stooped to fumble with the metal clasp, then started violently jerking upward. Bigger, without answering, and before he realized what he was doing, his whir he whirled, his eyes wide with fear, and his hand half raised as though to ward off a blow. The moment of whirling brought him face to face with what seemed to his excited senses an army of white men. 
His breast stopped and he blinked an eye in the red darkness, thinking that he should be acting more calmly. Then he saw Mr. Dalton and another white man standing at the far end of the basement. In the red shadows, their faces were white discs of anger floating still in the air. Oh, he said softly. The white man at Mr. Dalton's side was squinting at him. He felt that tight, hot, choking fear returning. The white man clicked on the light. He had a cold and personal manner that told Bigger to be on his guard. And the very look of the eyes man's Bigger saw his own personality reflected in narrow, restricted terms. What's the matter, boy? the man asked. Bigger said nothing. He swallowed, caught hold of himself, and came forward slowly. The white man's eyes were steadily upon him. Panic seized Bigger as he saw the white man lower his head, narrow his eyes more still, sweep back his coat, and ram his hands into his pants pocket, revealing as he did so with shining badge on his chest. Words ring in Bigger's mind. This is a cop. You cannot take the eyes off the shining bit of metal. Abruptly, the man changed his attitude and expression and took his hands from his pockets and smiled a smile that Bigger did not believe. I'm not the law boy, so don't be scared. Bigger clamped his teeth. He had to control himself. He should not have let that man see him staring at his badge. Yes, sir, he said. Bigger, this is Mr. Britton, Mr. Dalton said. He's a private investigator attached to the staff of my office. Yes, sir, Bigger said again, his tension slackening. He wants to ask you some questions, so just be calm and try to answer to tell him whatever he wants to know. Yes, sir. First of all, I want to have a look at that truck, Britton said. Bigger stood aside as they passed him. He glanced quickly at the furnace. It was still very hot, droning. Then he, too, went to the trunk, standing discreetly to one side, away from the two white men, looking with white eyes at what they were doing. He shoved his hands deep into his pockets. He stood at a peculiar attitude that allowed him to respond at once to whatever they said or did, and at the same time to be outside and away from them. He watched Britton turn the trunk over and bend it to it and try to work the lock. I gotta be careful, Bigger thought. One little slip now and I'll spoil the whole thing. Sweat came onto his neck and face. Britton could not unlock the trunk, and he looked upward at Bigger. It's locked. You got a key, boy? No, sir. Bigger wondered if this were a trap. He decided to play safe and speak only when he was spoken to. You mind if I break it? Go right ahead, Mr. Dalton said. Say, Bigger, get Mr. Britton the hatchet. Yes, sir, he answered mechanically. He thought rapidly. His entire body stiffened. Should he tell them that the hatchet was somewhere in the house and offer to go after it and take the opportunity to run away? How much did they really suspect him? Was the whole thing a ruse to confuse and trap him? He glanced sharply and intently at their faces. They seemed to be waiting only for the hatchet. Yes, he would take a chance and stay. He would lie his way out of this. He turned and went to the spot where the hatchet had been last night, the spot from which he had taken it to cut off Mary's head. He stopped and pretended to search, then straightened. It ain't here now. I, I saw it about here yesterday, he mumbled. Well, never mind, Britton said. I think I can manage. Bigger eased back toward them, waiting, watching. Britton lifted his foot and gave the lock a short, stout kick with the heel of his shoe, and it sprang open. He lifted out the tray and looked inside. It was half empty, and the clothes were disarrayed and tumbled. You see, Mr. Dalton said, she didn't take all of her things. Yes, in fact, she didn't need a trunk at all from the looks of this, Britton said. Bigger, was the trunk locked when she told you to take it down? Mr. Dalton asked. Yes, sir, Bigger said wondering if that were the, was the safest. Was she too drunk to know what she was doing, Bigger? Well, they went in the room, he said. I went after them. They all told, she, then she told me to take the trunk. That's all that happened. She could have put these things into a small suitcase, Britton said. The fire sang in Bigger's ears, and he saw the red shadows dance on the walls. Let them try to find out who did it. His teeth were clamped hard until they ached. Sit down, Bigger, Britton said. Bigger looked at Britton, feigning surprise. Sit on the trunk, Britton said. Me? Yeah, sit down. He sat. Now take your time and think hard. I want to ask you some questions. Yes, sir. What time did you take Miss Dalton from here last night? About 8.30, sir. Bigger knew that this was it. The man was here to find out everything. This was an examination. He would have to point his answers away from himself quite definitely. He would have to tell his story. He would let each of the facts of his story fall slowly as though he did not realize the significance of them. He would answer only what he was asked. You drove her to school? He hung his head and did not answer. Come on, boy. Well, mister, you see, I'm just working here. What do you mean? Mr. Dalton came close and looked hard into his face. Answer his questions, Bigger. Yes, sir. You drove her to school? Britton asked again. Still, he did not answer. I asked you a question, boy. No, sir, I didn't drive her to school. Where did you take her? Well, sir, she told me after I got as far as the park to turn around and take her to the loop. She didn't go to the school, Mr. Dalton asked, his lips hanging open in surprise. No, sir. Why didn't you tell me this before, Bigger? She told me not to. There was silence. The furnace droned. Huge red shadows swam across the wall. 
Where did you take her then? Britton asked. To the loop, sir. Whereabouts in the loop? To Lake Street, sir. Do you remember the number? 16, I think, sir. 16 Lake Street? Yes, sir. That's the Labor Defender's office, Mr. Dalton said, turning to Britton. That this Jan's a red. How long was she in there? Britton asked. About half an hour, I reckon, sir. Then what happened? Well, I waited in the car. She stayed there till you brought her home? No, sir. She came out. They came out. This man Jan was with her then? Yes, sir. He was with her. Seems to me she went in there to get him. She didn't say anything. She just went in and stayed a while and then came out with him. Then you drove him? He drove, Bigger said. Weren't you driving? Yes, sir, but he wanted to drive and she told me to let him. There was another silence. They wanted him to draw the picture and he would draw it like he wanted it. He was trembling with excitement. In the past, had not, had not they always drawn the picture for him? He could tell them anything he wanted and what could they do about it. It was his word against Jan's and Jan was a red. You waited somewhere for him, Britton asked. The tone of curt hostility had suddenly left his voice. No, sir, I was in the car. Where did they go? He wanted to tell of how they had made him sit between them, but he thought that he would tell that later on when he was telling how Jan and Mary had made him feel. Well, Mr. Jan asked me where a good place to eat. The only one I knew was where white folks, he said. White folks very slowly so that they would know he was conscious of what was meant. Eight on the south side was Ernie's kitchen shack. You drove him there? Mr. Jan drove the car, sir. How long did they stay? Well, we must have stayed. Weren't you waiting in the car? No, sir. You see, mister, I did what they told me. I was only working for them. Oh, Britton said. I suppose he made you eat with them. I didn't want to, mister. I swear I didn't. He kept worrying me till I went in. Britton walked away from the trunk, running the fingers of his hand nervously through his hair. Again, he turned to Bigger. They got drinking, huh? Yes, they was drinking. What did this Jan say to you? He talked about the communists. How much did they drink? It seemed like a lot to me, sir. Then you brought him home? I drove him through the park, sir. Then you brought him home? Yes, sir. That was nearly two. How drunk was Miss Dalton? Well, she couldn't hardly stand up, sir. When we got home, he had to lift her up the stairs, Bigger said with lowered eyes. That's all right, boy. You can talk to us about it, Britton said. Just how drunk was she? She passed out, Bigger said. Britton looked at Dalton. She could not have left this house by herself, Britton said. If Miss Dalton's right, then she could not have left. Britton stared at Bigger, and Bigger felt that some deeper question was on Britton's mind. What else happened? He would shoot now. He would let him have some of it. Well, I told you Miss Dalton told me to take the trunk. I said that because she told me not to tell about me taking her to the loop. It was Mr. Jan who told me to take the trunk and not put the car away. He told you not to put the car away and take the trunk? Yes, sir, that's right. Why didn't you tell us this before, Bigger? Asked Mr. Dalton. She told me not to, sir. How is this Jan acting? Britton asked. He was drunk, Bigger said, feeling that now was the time to drag Jan indefinitely. Mr. Jan was the one who told me to take the trunk down and leave the car in the snow. I told you Miss Dalton told me that, but he told me. I would have been giving the whole thing away if I had told about Mr. Jan. Britton walked toward the furnace and back again. The furnace droned as before. Bigger hoped that no one would try to look into it now. His throat grew dry. Then he started ner then he stared nervously at Britton world and pointed his finger into his face. What did he say about the party? Sir? Ah, oh, come on, boy. Don't stall. Tell me what he said about the party. The party? He asked me to sit at his table. I mean the party. It wasn't a party, mister. He made me sit at his table and he bought chicken and told me to eat. I didn't want to, but he made me and it was my job. Britton came close to Bigger and narrowed his gray eyes. What unit are you in? Sir, come on, comrade. Tell me what unit you're in. Bigger gazed at him, speechless, alarmed. Who's your organizers? I don't know what you mean, Bigger said, his voice quavering. Don't you read the daily? Daily what? Didn't you know Jan before you came to work her? No, sir. No, sir. Didn't they send you to Russia? Bigger stared and did not answer. He knew now that Britain was trying to find out if he were a communist. It was something he had not counted on, ever. He stood up, trembling. He had not thought that this thing could go two ways. Slowly, he shook his head and backed away. No, sir, you got me wrong. I never fooled around with him, folks. Miss Dalton and Mr. Jan was the first ones I ever met, so help me God. Britton followed Bigger till Bigger's head struck the wall. Bigger looked squarely into his eyes. Britton, with the movement so fast that Bigger did not see it, grabbed him in the collar and rammed his head hard against the wall. He saw a flash of red. You are a communist, you goddamn black son of a bitch, and you're going to tell me about Miss Dalton and that Jan bastard. No, nah, sir, I ain't no communist. No, nah, sir. Well, what's this? Britton jerked from his pocket the small packet of pamphlets that Bigger had put in the dresser drawer and held them under his eyes. You know you're lying. Come on, talk. 
No, sir, you got me wrong. Mr. Jan gave them to me. He and Miss Dalton told me to read them. Didn't you know Miss Dalton before? No, sir. Wait, Britton. Mr. Dalton laid his hand on Britton's arm. Wait, there's something to what he says. She tried to talk to him about unions when she first saw him yesterday. If that Jan gave him those pamphlets, then he knows nothing about it. You sure? I'm positive. I thought at first when you brought me those pamphlets that he must have known something, but I don't think he does, and there's no use in blaming him for something he didn't do. Britton loosed his fingers from Bigger's collar and shrugged his shoulders. Bigger relaxed, still standing, his head resting against the wall, aching. He had not thought that anyone would dare think that he, a black Negro, would be Jan's partner. Britton was his enemy. He knew that the hard light in Britton's eyes held him guilty because he was black. He hated Britton so hard and hot while standing there with sleepy eyes and parted lips that he would gladly have grabbed the iron shovel from the corner and split his skull in two. For a split second, a roaring noise in his ears blotted out sound. He struggled to control himself, and then he heard Britton talking. Got to get a hold of that, Jan. That seems to be the next thing, Mr. Dalton said, sighing. Bigger felt that if he said something directly to Mr. Dalton, he could swing things around in his favor, but he did not know just how to put it. You suppose she ran off, he heard Britton ask. I don't know, Mr. Dalton said. Bigger turned. Britton turned to Bigger and looked at him. Bigger kept his eyes down. Bigger, I just want to know, are you telling the truth? Yes, sir, I'm telling the truth. I just started to work here last night. I ain't done nothing. I did just what they told me to. You sure he's all right? Britton asked Dalton. He's all right. If you don't want me to work for you, Mr. Dalton, Bigger said, I'll go home. I didn't want to come here, he continued, feeling that his words would be awakened in Mr. Dalton a sense of why he was here, but they sent me anyhow. That's true, Mr. Dalton told Britton. He's referred to me from a relief. He's been in reform school, and I'm just giving him a chance. Mr. Dalton turned to Bigger. Just forget it, Bigger. We had to make sure. Stay on and do your work. I'm sorry this had to happen. Don't let this break you down. Yes, sir. Okay, said Britton. If you say he's okay, then it's okay with me. Go on to your room, Bigger, said Mr. Dalton. Yes, sir. Head down, he walked to the rear of the furnace and upstairs to his room. He turned the latch on the door and hurried to the closet to listen. The voices came clearly. Britton and Mr. Dalton had come into the kitchen. My, but it was hot down there, said Mr. Dalton. Yes, I'm a little sorry you bothered him. He's here to try to get a new slant on things. Well, you see him one way and I see him another. To me, they're all the same. But he's sort of a problem boy. He's not really bad. You gotta be rough with him, Dalton. See, that's how I got dope out of him. You wouldn't have told, he wouldn't have told you that. But I don't wanna make a mistake here. It wasn't his fault. He was doing what that crazy daughter of mine told him. I don't wanna do anything I'll regret. After all, these black boys never get a chance. They don't need a chance, if you ask me. They get in enough trouble without it. Just as long as they do their work, let's let them be. Just as you say, you want me to stay on the job? Sure, we must see this, Jan. I can't understand Mary's going away and not saying anything. I can have him picked up. No, no, not that way. Those reds will get a hold of it and they'll raise a stink in the papers. Well, what do you want me to do? I'll try to get him to come here. I'll phone his office, and if he's not there, I'll phone his home. Bigger heard their footsteps dying away. A door slammed and then all was quiet. He came out of the closet and looked in the dresser drawer where he had put the pamphlets. Yes, Britton had searched his room. His clothes were mussed and tumbled. He would know how to handle Britton next time. Britton was familiar to him. He had met a thousand Brittons in his life. He stood in the center of the room thinking. When Britton questioned Jan, would Jan deny having been with Mary at all in order to protect her? If he did, that would be in his favor. If Britton wanted to check on his story about Mary not going to school last night, he could. If Jan said they had not been drinking, it would be proved that they had been drinking by folks in the cafe. If Jan lied about one thing, it would be readily believed that he would lie about others. If Jan said that he had not come to the house, who would believe him after it was seen that he had lied about not drinking and about Mary not going to school? If Jan tried to protect Mary, as he thought he would, he would only succeed in making a case against himself. Bigger went to the window and looked out the white curtain of falling snow. He thought of the kidnap note. Should he try to get money from them now? Hell yes. He would show that Britain bastard. He should work fast. He would wait until after Jan had told his story. He should see Bessie tonight, and he ought to pick out the pencil and paper he would use. And he must not forget to use gloves when he wrote the note so that no fingerprints would be on the paper. He'd give that Britain something to worry about, all right? Just wait. Because he could go now, run off if he wanted to, and leave it all behind, he felt a certain sense of power, a power born of a latent capacity to live. He was conscious of this quiet, warm, clean, rich house, this room with beds so soft, the wealthy white people moving in luxury to all sides of him, white lives and smugness, a security, a certainty that he had never known. 
The knowledge that he had killed a white girl they loved and regarded as their symbol of beauty made him feel the equal of them, like a man who had been somehow cheated, but now even the score. The more the sense of Britain seeped in him, the more he did like the feel to need to face him once again and let him try to get something from him. Next time he would do better. He had let Britain trap him on the communist business. He should have been on the lookout for that. But the lucky thing was that he knew that Britain had done all those tricks at once, had shot his bolt, had played all of his cards. Now that was the thing out in the open, he would know how to act. And furthermore, Britain might want him as a witness against Jan. He smiled where he lay in the darkness. If that happened, he could be safe in sending the ransom note. He could send it just when they had thought they had pinned the disappearance of Mary upon Jan. They would throw everything into confusion and would make them want to reply and give the money at once and save the girl. The warm room lulled his blood and a deeping sense of fatigue drugged him with sleep. He stretched out more fully on the bed, sighed, turned on his back, swallowed, and closed his eyes. Out of the surrounding silence and darkness came the quiet ringing of a distant church bell, thin, faint, but clear. It tolled soft, then loud, then still louder, so loud that he wondered where it was. It sounded suddenly directly above his head, and we looked. It was not there, but went on tolling, and with each passing moment, he felt an urgent need to run and hide as though the bell were sounding a warning, and he stood on a street corner in a red glare of light, like that which came from the furnace, and he had a big package in his arms, so wet and slippery and heavy that he could scarcely hold on to it, and he wanted to know what was in the package, and he stopped near an alley corner and wrapped it, and the paper fell away, and he saw it was his own head, his own head lying with black face and half-closed eyes and lips parted with white teeth showing, and hair wet with blood, and the red glare grew brighter like light shining down from a red moon and red stars on a hot summer night, and he was sweating and breathless from running, and the bell clanged so loud that he could hear the iron tongue clapping against the metal sides each time it swung to and fro, and he was running over a street paved with black hole, and his shoes kicked tiny lumps rattling against tin cans, and he knew that very soon he had to find some place to hide, but there was no place, and in front of him white people were coming to ask him about the head from which the newspapers had fallen, and which was now slippery with blood in his naked hands. And he had to give up and stood in the middle of the street and the red darkness and cursed the booming bell and the white people and felt that he did not give a damn what happened to him. And when the people closed in, he hurled the bloody head squarely into their faces. Dong, dong, dong. He opened his eyes and looked at about him in the darkened room, hearing a bell ring. He sat up. The bell sounded again. How long had it been ringing? He got to his feet, swaying from stiffness, trying to shake off sleep that awful dream. Yes, um, he mumbled. The bell rang again, insistently. He fumbled in the dark for the light chain and pulled it. Excitement quickened within him. Had something happened? Was this the police? Bigger, a muffled voice called. Yes, sir. He braced himself for whatever was coming and stepped to the door. As he opened it, he felt being pushed in by someone who seemed determined to get in in a hurry. Bigger backed away, blinking in his eyes. We want to talk to you, said Britton. Yes, sir. He did not hear what Britton said after that, for he saw directly behind Britton a face that made him hold his breath. It was not fear he felt, but attention, a supreme gathering of all the forces of his body for a showdown. Go on in, Mr. Alone, Mr. Dalton said. Bigger saw Jan's eyes looking at him steadily. Jan stepped into the room, and Mr. Dalton followed. Bigger stood with his lips slightly parted, his hands hanging loosely by his sides, his eyes watchful but veiled. Sit down, Alone, Britton said. This is all right, Jan said. I'll stand. Bigger saw Britton pull from his coat pocket the packet of pamphlets and hold them under Jan's eyes. Jan's lips twisted into a faint smile. Well, Jan said, you're one of those tough reds, huh? Britton asked. Come on, let's get this over with, Jan said. What do you want? Take it easy, Britton said. You've got plenty of time. I know you're kind. You like to rush and have things your way. Bigger saw Mr. Dalton standing to one side, looking anxiously from one to the other. Several times, Mr. Dalton made as if to say something, then checked himself as though uncertain. Bigger, Britton asked, is this the man Miss Dalton brought here last night? Jan's lips parted. He stared at Britton, then at Bigger. Yes, sir, Bigger whispered, struggling to control his feelings, hating Jan violently because he knew he was hurting him, wanting to strike Jan with something because Jan's wise and credulous stare made him feel hot guilt to the very core of him. You didn't bring me here, Bigger, Jan said. Why do you tell them that? Bigger did not answer. He decided to talk only to Britton and Mr. Dalton. There was silence. Jan was staring at Bigger. Britton and Mr. Dalton were watching Jan. Jan made a move towards Bigger, but Britton's arm checked him. Say, what is this? Jan demanded. What are you making this boy lie for? I suppose you're going to tell us you weren't drunk last night, huh? Asked Britton. What business is that of yours? Jan shot at him. Where's Miss Dalton? Britton asked. Jan looked round the room, puzzled. She's in Detroit, he said. You know your story by heart, don't you? Britton said. 
Say, Bigger, what are they doing to you? Don't be afraid. Speak up, said Jan. Bigger did not answer. He looked stonily at the floor. Where did Miss Dalton tell you she was going? Britton asked. She told me she was going to Detroit. Did you see her last night? Jan hesitated. No. You didn't give these pamphlets to this boy last night? Jan shrugged his shoulders, smiled, and said, All right, I saw her. So what? You know why I didn't say so in the first place? No, we don't know, Britton said. Well, Mr. Dalton here doesn't like reds, as you call him, and I didn't want to get Miss Dalton in trouble. Then you did meet her last night? Yes. Where is she? If she's not in Detroit, then I don't know where she is. You gave these pamphlets to this boy? Yes, I did. You and Miss Dalton were drunk last night? Ah, oh, come on. We weren't drunk. We had a little to drink. You brought her home about two? Bigger stiffened and waited. Yeah. You told the boy to take the trunk down to the basement? Jan opened his mouth, but no words came. He looked at Bigger, then back at Britton. Say, what is this? Where's my daughter, Mr. Alone? Mr. Dalton asked. I tell you, I don't know. Listen, let's be frank, Mr. Alone, said Dalton. We know my daughter was drunk last night when you brought her here. She was too drunk to leave here by herself. Do you know where she is? I, I didn't come here last night, Jan stammered. Bigger sensed that Jan had said that he had come home with Mary last night in order to make Mr. Dalton believe he would not have left his daughter alone in a car with a strange chauffeur. And Bigger felt that after Jan admitted that they had been drinking, he was bound to say that he had brought the girl home. Unwittingly, Jan's desire to protect Mary had helped him. Jan's denial of having come to the home would not be believed now. It would make Mr. Dalton and Britton feel he was trying to cover up something of even much greater seriousness. You didn't come home with her, Mr. Dalton asked? No. You didn't tell the boy to take the trunk down? Hell no. Who says I did? I left the car and took a trolley home. Jan turned and faced Bigger. Bigger, what are you telling these people? Bigger did not answer. He just told us what you did last night, Britton said. Where's Mary? Where's Miss Dalton? Jan asked. We're waiting for you to tell us, said Britton. Didn't, didn't, didn't she go to Detroit? Jan stammered. No, said Mr. Dalton. I called her this morning and Peggy told me she had. You called just to see if the family had missed her, didn't you? Asked Britton. Jan walked over to Bigger. Leave him alone, Britton said. Bigger said, Jan said, why did you tell these men I came here? You say you didn't come here at all last night, Mr. Dalton asked. Absolutely not. Bigger, tell him when I left the car. Bigger said nothing. Come on, Erlone. I don't know what you're up to, but you've been lying ever since you've been in this room. You said you didn't come here last night, and then you say you did. You said you weren't drunk last night, and then you say you were. You said you didn't see Miss Dalton last night, and then you say you did. Come on now, tell us where Miss Dalton is. Her father and mother want to know. Bigger saw Jan's bewildered eyes. Listen, I've told you all I know, said Jan, putting his hat back on. Unless you tell me what this joke's all about, I'm getting on back home. Wait a minute, said Mr. Dalton. Mr. Dalton came forward a step in front of Jan. You and I don't agree. Let's forget that. I want to know where my daughter is. Is this a game, asked Jan? No, no, said Mr. Dalton. I want to know. I'm worried. I tell you, I don't know. Listen, Mr. Alone, Mary's the only girl we've got. I don't want her to do anything rash. Tell her to come back or you bring her back. Mr. Dalton, I'm telling you the truth. Listen, Mr. Dalton said, I'll make it right with you. Jan's face reddened. What do you mean? I'll make it worth your while. You son, Jan stopped. He walked to the door. Let him go, said Britton. He can't get away. I'll phone and have him picked up. He knows more than he's telling. Jan paused in the doorway, looking at all three of them. Then he went out. Bigger sat on the edge of the bed and heard Jan's feet run down the stairs. A door slammed, then silence. Bigger saw Mr. Dalton gazing at him queerly. He did not like that look. But Britton was jotting something on a pad, his face pale and hard in the yellow glare of the suspended electric bulb. You're telling us the truth about all this, aren't you, Bigger? Mr. Dalton asked. Yes, sir. He's all right, Britton said. Come on, let's get to a phone. I'm having that guy picked up for questioning. It's the only thing to do. I'll have some men go over to Miss Dalton's room. We'll find out what happened. I'll bet my right arm that goddamn red's up to something. Britton went out and Mr. Dalton followed, leaving Bigger still on the edge of the bed. When he heard the door slam, he got up and grabbed his cap and went softly down the stairs into the basement. He stood a moment looking through the cracks into the humming fire, blindingly red now. Then he went into the driveway through the falling snow to the street. He had to see Bessie at once. The kidnap note had to be sent right away. There was no time to lose. Mr. Dalton, Britton, or Peggy missed him and asked where he had gone. He would say that he had gone out to get a package of cigarettes. But with all the excitement, no one would probably think of him. They were after Jan now. He was safe. Bigger. He stopped, whirled, his hand reaching inside of his shirt for his gun. He saw Jan standing in the doorway of a store. As Jan came forward, Bigger backed away. Jan stopped. For Christ's sakes, Bigger, don't be afraid of me. I'm not going to hurt you. In the pale yellow sheen of the street lamp, they faced each other. Huge wet flakes of snow floated down slowly, forming a delicate stream screen between them. Bigger had his hand inside of his shirt on his gun. Jan stood staring, his mouth open. 
What's all this all about, Bigger? I haven't done anything to you, have I? Where's Mary? Bigger felt guilty. Jan's presence condemned him. Yet he knew of no way to atone for his guilt. He felt he had to act as he was acting. I don't want to talk to you, he mumbled. But what have I done to you, Jan asked desperately. Jan had done nothing to him, and it was Jan's innocence that made anger rise in him. His fingers tightened about the gun. I don't want to talk to you, he said again. He felt that if Jan continued to stand there and make him feel this awful sense of guilt, he would have to shoot him in spite of himself. He began to tremble all over. His lips parted as in his eyes widened. Go away, Bigger said. Listen, Bigger, if these people are bothering you, just tell me. Don't be scared. I'm used to this sort of thing. Listen now. Let's go somewhere and get a cup of coffee and talk this thing over. Jan came forward again and Bigger drew his gun. Jan stopped. His face whitened. For God's sake, man, what are you doing? Don't shoot. I haven't bothered you. Don't. Leave me alone, Bigger said, his voice tense and hysterical. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Jan backed away from him. Leave me alone, Bigger's voice rose to a scream. Jan backed farther away, then turned and walked rapidly off, looking back over his shoulder. When he reached the corner, he ran through the snow out of sight. Bigger stood still, the gun in his hand. He had utterly forgotten where he was. His eyes were still riveted on that point in space where he had last seen Jan's retreating form. The tension in him slackened and he lowered the gun until it hung at his side, loosely in his finger. He was coming back into possession of himself. For the past three minutes it seemed he had been under a strange spell, possessed by a force which he hated, but which he had to obey. He was startled when he heard soft footsteps coming toward him in the snow. He looked and saw a white woman. The woman saw him and paused. She turned abruptly and ran across the street. Bigger shoved the gun in his pocket and ran to the corner. He looked back. The woman was vanishing through the snow in the opposite direction. In him as he walked was a cold, driving will. He would go through with this. He would work fast. He had encountered in Jan a much stronger determination than he thought he would. If he sent the kidnapped note, it would have to be done before Jan could prove that he was completely innocent. That moment he did not care if he was caught. If only he could cower Jan and Britain into awe, into fear of him and his black skin and his humble manners. He reached a corner and went into a drugstore. A white clerk came to him. Give me an envelope, some paper, and a pencil, he said. He paid the money, put the package into his pocket, and went out to the corner to wait for a car. One came, he got on and rode eastward, wondering what kind of note he would write. He rang the bell for the car to stop, got off and walked past the quiet Negro streets. Now and then he passed an empty building, white and silent in the night. He could make Bessie hide in one of these buildings and watch for Mr. Dalton's car. But the ones he passed were too old. If one went into them, they might collapse. He walked on. He had to find a building where Bessie could stand in a window and see the package of money when it was thrown from the car. He reached Langley Avenue and walked westward towards Wabash Avenue. There were many empty buildings with black windows, like blind ones, buildings like skeletons standing with snow on their bones in the winter winds, but none of them were on corners. Finally, at Michigan Avenue in East 36th Place, he saw the one he wanted. It was tall, white, silent, standing on a well-lighted corner. By looking from any of the front windows, Bessie would be able to see all four directions. Oh, he had to have a flashlight. He went to a drugstore and bought one for a dollar. He felt in the inner pocket of his coat for his gloves. Now he was ready. He crossed the street and stood waiting for a car. His feet were cold and he stamped them in the snow, surrounded by people waiting too for a car. He did not look at them. They were simply blind people, blind like his mother, his brother, his sister, Peggy, Britton, Jan, Mr. Dalton, and the sightless Mrs. Dalton, in the quiet, empty houses with their black, gaping windows. He looked round the street and saw a sign in the buildings. This property is managed by the Southside Real Estate Company. He had heard that Mr. Dalton owned the Southside Real Estate Company, and the Southside Real Estate Company owned the house in which he lived. He paid $8 a week for a one-rat-infested room. He had never seen Mr. Dalton until he had come to work for him. His mother always took the rent to the real estate office. Mr. Dalton was somewhere far away, high up, distant like a god. He owned property all over the Black Belt, and he owned property where white folks lived too. But Bigger could not live in a building across the line. Even though Mr. Dalton gave millions of dollars for Negro education, he could rent houses to Negroes only in the prescribed area, the corner of the city tumbling down from rot. In a sullen way, Bigger was conscious of this. Yes, he would send the kidnap note. He would jar them out of their senses. When the car came, he rode south and got off at 51st Street and walked to Bessie's. He had to ring five times before the buzzer answered. God damn it, I bet she's drunk, he thought. He mounted the steps and saw her peering at him through the door with eyes red from sleep and alcohol. His doubt of her made him fearful and angry. Bigger, she asked. Go on back in the room, he said. What's the matter, she asked, backing away, her mouth open. Let me in. Open the door. She threw the door wide, almost stumbling as she did so. Turn on the light. What's the matter, Bigger? How many times do you want me to ask you to turn on the light? She turned it on. Pull them shades. She lowered the shades. 
He stood watching her. Now I don't want any trouble out of her. He went to the dresser and pushed her jars and combs and brushes aside, took the package from his pocket and laid it in the cleared space. Bigger. He turned and looked at her. What? You ain't really planning to do that, sure enough. What the hell you think? Bigger naw. Nah. He caught her arm and squeezed it in a grip of fear and hate. You ain't going to turn away from me now. Not now, goddamn you. She said nothing. He took off his cap and coat and threw them on the bed. They're wet, bigger. So what? I ain't doing this, she said. Like hell you ain't. You can't make me. You done helped me to steal enough from folks you worked for to put you in jail already. She did not answer. He turned from her and got a chair and pulled it to the dresser. He unwrapped the package and balled the paper into a knot and threw it in the corner of the room. Instinctively, Bessie stooped to pick it up. Bigger laughed and she straightened suddenly. Yes, Bessie was blind. He was about to write a kidnap note and she was worried about the cleanliness of her room. What's the matter, she asked. Nothing. She was smiling grimly. He took out the pencil. It was not sharpened. Give me a knife. Ain't you got one? Hell nah, give me a knife. What do you, you do with your knife? He stared at her, remembering that she knew that he had a knife. An image of blood gleaming on the metal blade in the glare of the furnace came before his eyes, and fear rose in him hotly. You want me to slap you? She went behind a curtain. He sat looking at the paper and pencil. She came back with the butcher knife.